a just, stable, and sustainable world for all life. It's the future that 2020 reminded us we really need. While it can be hard to imagine the huge shifts it will take to get there, one thing remains certain, how essential we are to each other. People to people, people to nature, nature to everything. Indeed, these connections are the bedrock of our existence. When nature thrives, people thrive. But even when we acknowledge this truth on a planetary scale, it's easy to lose sight of what that means to individual communities and individual people. Welcome. This is the Emerging World Project podcast. What are you doing here? I am your host, Addison Brown. And I am your co-host, Mark. Our guest today is Joey Solomine. She is a veterinary nurse, wildlife conservationist, conservation student, and the founder of the Jungle Rescue Reform. Joey studied animal science and pre-veterinary medicine at Rutgers University and is currently studying wildlife conservation biology through Unity College of Maine. She travels to wildlife rehabilitation centers across Central and South America predominantly in the Amazon region, where she helps rehabilitate, medically care for, research, and eventually release wildlife victims of the illegal pet trade. She has been traveling to and working in the jungle for almost seven years now, doing research on ethical wildlife rehabilitation practices, controversies, and successful rehabilitation with a focus on primate behavior and how primate cognitive complexities may complicate the rehabilitation process and what we think we know about it. Her goal is to help build on what we know about rehabilitating wildlife that were once held as pets or used as tourist attractions, especially primates. Her organization also aims to help bring funding and support to wildlife rescue centers operating in remote parts of the world with a focus on the Amazon rainforest. They also aim to advocate for locals who run these sanctuaries and to bridge the gaps that exist between the experts and the professionals, the science and the firsthand experience of those native to those jungle areas. Please join me in welcoming our guest, Joey. Hello. Hello. Hey, Joey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. I am. I'm just really looking forward to this, to this call. I love that it was so far out in terms of when we scheduled it. So I've had a lot of time to, to um, spend with your work. And okay. so <laughs> super excited to be able to speak with you. Yeah, same. I'm, I'm very I'm, excited. Yeah. Thank you. How was your holiday? It was good. It was good. Um, I spent it at home with a close family. And that was pretty much it. But it was very nice, very festive. Oh, good. That sounds really good. Mm-hmm. So you weren't trapped somewhere. Uh, we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I love to um, start off these conversations and just sort of get a little feel about your early childhood and leaning into what your earliest memory of your relationship to the natural world is and where does that memory take you? Um, okay. Yeah. So when I was growing up, I, we, we lived right across the street from the beach. So I think my first experience with the natural world was definitely, is definitely associated with the beach, the ocean, um, swimming, you know, being around fish and crabs. <laughs> that was the first part of it. And just, you know, I, I loved being out there. And at, you know, at the beach, it just feels like a very natural setting where you just feel really connected and away from everything else in the world. Um, so I, I was able to grow up and kind of have that all the time, which was, was really nice as a kid. 
That is pretty spectacular. Did you have family that encouraged you to get in the water and explore and, or was that just a natural inclination for you? No, everything I did with exploring nature was completely natural. Um, mm. My, uh, my parents supported my love of nature. And, and even, you know, when I was, when I was like seven years old, eight years old, I would go into the woods and I would catch frogs and salamanders and I would play with stray cats and everything that I, you know, wanted to do with that, which was all day, every day, I wanted to do something associated with either being outside or animals. Um, they supported it completely. Um, I had like distant relatives, more distant relatives, like uncles and aunts who were kind of concerned about it, I yeah, guess. Mm -hmm. um, but my parents were very supportive of it. That's really beautiful and, and incredibly fortunate. I think the, the ones that don't, uh, or, or were unable, unable to support it. I always feel like that's, that's my lesson for them, right? Like that's what I'm going to yeah. bring to the relationship with this extended Absolutely. family or different friends. I kind of feel like I sense that that's what you get to do as well. That's really Absolutely. beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of leads me into the, the, any of uh, religious or, or we could say spiritual uh, affiliations at that time. And if you could recognize mm, that as affecting the way that you live your life now. Well, when I was, um, so when I was eight years old, my father passed away and my mother became religious when I was about nine. Um, and so naturally, you know, I was nine years old, so it kind of just followed suit and was religious as well. And, you know, went to church with her and studied the Bible um, but, you know, there were parts of it that I felt like a lot of it was more just focusing on what we as people do wrong. And it just, mm. as I got older, it didn't really, there was, there were parts that didn't feel like it really fit for me. Mm. Um, so, you know, fast forward a long time, uh, my first year in college, it was my first real in-depth biology course. And, I learned so much about evolution and nature and, and how we age the planet. And I kind of switched gears a little bit about what I felt towards religion, especially religion um, mm. and the Bible. And then kind of was just, you know, not really thinking much of anything. And then I want to say within the past five years, I've felt this deep, this very deep spiritual connection in my life. Um, that at first I couldn't really explain. I just remember feeling so connected to something out there. Um, and that something was always with me, especially during like some of the worst experiences of my life, some of the worst things that I've overcome and, and, and made it through. I've always felt like there was something there. And, and now over time, I feel like my personal beliefs is that it's definitely something such as the universe. I feel very connected to the universe. Mm. And that was truly magnified when I went to the Amazon rainforest. There's just this connection that I genuinely can't describe that I feel with the universe. And, and just that I just have this connection with it that I'm so grateful to have. And I think it's because I've been so open to to mm. nature and to my, what I feel is my purpose. Um, and so it just, I feel like it just is constantly giving me that feedback, especially when, when, you know, you're alone in the Amazon, it's a whole different experience. So I'd say right now that's where I'm at spiritually. And I do consider myself a spiritual person in that sense. Mm. Mm. That's really interesting that your mother um, brought religious in a much more uh, at a much more formative time in your life. And then much later you were able to discern and make your, and, and, and have the mm, capacity to make your own and listen to your own experience. I think I love hearing that from younger people these mm. days, right? Without needing to negate religion. Of course it has, um, you know, both sides, everything has both sides but without needing to negate it and encouraging the exploration of what one 
truly feels for themselves, right? Like that, yes. that individuation, but it, an individuation that brings one to a, a wholeness, which I'm sensing is what you're expressing about being in the Amazon. And we yes. will get to that because it sounds so incredibly um, unique, but also necessary. This is something that is so necessary for humanity to get back I don't want to say get back to, to um, remember, not connect, because we already are, but to remember what that connection feels like and to live from that space. Yes. So what was it that um, made you choose work in the veterinary field? And then if you could share with us a little bit what that journey was like for you. Um, so I, I, I first started going to school um, and my, what I wanted to do was a little bit all over the place. Uh, I, I thought I wanted to do like, uh, get a degree in zoology. It was kind of my plan. And then as I was, um, studying in school, I made some friends who had said that they were working in the veterinary field while studying. And so I went and pursued that myself and because they were like, you know, while you're studying, you can start working at the veterinary field. You don't have to have uh, your degree yet to already get your foot in the door. So I started doing that. And um, to my surprise, I was hired. And I started working as an assistant. And then while I was continuing my studies. Um, and in school, I kind of switched gears. I went into pre-veterinary medicine. And mm. um, eventually, I became a, a veterinary technician. Um or, you know, some people refer to us as veterinary nurses. Um, and that's where I ended up. And I thought that I wanted to, like I said, it, it, it kind of went all over the place for me with, with college. I knew I was going to do at something having to do with animals. So at first I was like, maybe zoology. Then I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. But working in a veterinary hospital and as a veterinary nurse, I was really able to see the full scope of things. Mm. And I just found, and a lot of people who are outside of the field don't really know this, but I just found that as a veterinary nurse, our position and our job is really, really cool. It's very interesting. We get to do a lot of the hands-on work. Mm. We get to be hands-on with the animals most. Um, and so after really learning and experiencing, which you can only experience hands-on, which is why I tell people don't make veterinary career decisions without working in the field for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but after experiencing what our field and, and position looks like, I decided I don't want to be a veterinarian. Also witnessing what their position looks like, it just wasn't something that I felt was a good fit for me because it is a lot of records, a lot of phone calls, a lot mm. of behind the scenes stuff that's just not as um, in direct contact with the animals and, and with their well-being and their care. So I decided I didn't want to do that. Um, but then again, I always knew that my calling is for is with wildlife. Mm -hmm. So I decided to continue my career in veterinary medicine as a veterinary nurse, but also continue pursuing my education in wildlife conservation. And then I kind of discovered that I wanted to combine the two a little bit and apply my veterinary knowledge to wildlife conservation. That's a beautiful train of thought. I just uh, visualize these, you know, large brush strokes, right? Like you're making a painting. And as you discover more and more, you fill in those spaces. And I just, mm -hmm. I love that. Like you, you didn't just set out and say, okay, this is what I'm going to be, blah, 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 blah. You just, you sort of felt your way into it and really trusted your own intuition. It feels like, I yeah, really, definitely. I love that. I appreciate definitely. that. I appreciate running into people or talking to people that have uh, created their lives or are living their lives in that way. So yeah. I commend you. I really Thank do. You. I really yeah, I commend always you. Say, I always say to people, especially when it comes to like career choices, um, and especially when it comes to animals, is that you kind of have to, you really have to get your, your feet wet in different areas. You have to experience mm -hmm. different areas of working with animals and, or working in nature, or working in biology, because a lot of times you, you, 
you don't really know about all the different opportunities that there are for you. And you don't know mm-hmm. about what it's really like to, to be in that field and to have those experiences until you're actually doing it. So I always encourage or tell people they really should get their feet wet in as many mm-hmm. opportunities as they can and kind of find themselves in it. Yeah, that's beautiful advice. So it, it really is good advice. I, I come from a generation of mm, women that were quickly to get out in the world and establish themselves in some of these major roles, whether it was in entertainment or medicine, or my best friend is a aerospace engineer and she worked oh, for NASA. Wow. Nice. And yeah, but, but, you know, we went out in the world and full force, right. And so we didn't realize that we could really feel into it. So although my best friend went into aerospace engineering, she ended up pivoting many, many years into it um, in another direction with slight, Mm. with still a slight relationship to the engineering aspect of aerospace. But um, my point was, I love that you took the time and that you're also advising folks to feel into it, you know, and whereas my generation was sort of, I'm sure we're not that different in age, but my generation was, um, full force. Like I'm going out, I'm not going to get married and have babies right away. I'm just going to go out and make this career. And then you wake up and you're like, Oh, huh. I think I might want to do something else. Mm -hmm. And our beautiful world is affording us to be able to do that. So let's get down to a little bit of nitty gritty here. Um, we all know that, that animals are suffering, immensely, both domestically and uh, most importantly in the wild, which I believe is connected to our, our disconnect with nature at the moment. Mm-hmm. So my question has to do with how and why did you choose to focus on the animals in the Amazon and most specifically primates? So as far as the Amazon goes, um, I... I always knew that I was going to do wildlife work, but I wasn't sure where I was going to take it. And I've always dreamed of going to this place called Borneo. It's um, Mm -hmm. an island off the coast of Malaysia. Um, And I had always planned on going there. And it was one of my dream locations to go to and maybe do some wildlife work. But I, I slowly started to do a little bit of research And I found this elephant sanctuary in Thailand and I decided in, I think it was 2015, that I was going to go there and that was going to be like the first place where I experienced wildlife and and wildlife conservation, wildlife work. But then after doing some research that I'm I'm glad I ended up doing, uh, I found that the place wasn't exactly ethical and Mm. that working with them wasn't in the best interest of the animals, even though they presented themselves as though it was. Um, it, the reality is it really wasn't. And I wasn't too educated at the time on ethical elephant rehabilitation. Mm. Um, so I got a little bit more educated on that. And then I decided not to pursue that. But I, I was so excited about going that I was like, I, I definitely know that I, I want to go abroad. I'm ready to start going abroad and working with wildlife. So I just kept doing more research, more research, and trying to find ethical sanctuaries. And the first place it brought me to was Costa Rica. And uh, Costa Rica is in Central America. It's not exactly the Amazon, but it is near tropical rainforest. Uh, and it, and it ha- has pretty much a lot of the same species as the Amazon rainforest has in South America. So... I started out there and I was introduced to a species called Kinkachu and mm. a species called Coetamundis, and they both belong to the same family, family Procyonidae. And I became so fascinated by them. And I thought that I wanted to maybe pursue working with this species. Um, and so I worked with them in Costa Rica. I, I got very interested in them. And of course, while working in Costa Rica, I was also with other animals. I was with mm, turtles. I was with monkeys, of course, uh, lots of sloths, of course. But mm-hmm. at the time, I was not interested in monkeys at all. 
Mm. I felt like monkeys were a very popular sort of poster child of conservation mm. and wildlife. And I felt like these other species, a lot of people didn't know about and weren't talking as much about. So that's why I thought I wanted to go in that direction. So I continued to go to the Amazon every few months doing the same type of, at first it started off as volunteer work. And then I was getting more into um, veterinary nursing work with these animals. And I was going to um, Peru and Ecuador. And each time at these wildlife sanctuaries, there would be monkeys present. And at first, I, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't a big fan of monkeys, although I love and have always loved all animals. <laughs> I was not... <laughs> You know, monkeys, they, um, my first experience, one-on-one -on -one experience with a monkey was with a spider monkey. I was trying to feed some of the wild pigs we had at a sanctuary in Ecuador. And one of the spider monkeys grabbed me <laughs> by the back of my hair, yanked my hair so hard. It felt like a grown man was trying to pull oh my goodness. like my scalp off of my head. And I was like, oh my God, like these monkeys are crazy. <laughs> like I love them and I would take care of them. But I was like, this is just not, I, I'm not too interested in them. <laughs> but every time going abroad and being exposed to them and working with them more and more, I got to know them on mm. a different level. Mm. And I got to understand that since they are such a cognitively complex species that um, requires such special care during rehabilitation mm. Mm. I came came to be very passionate about doing it right and and researching it more and although I still love all the other species I get to work with including the coatis and the kinkachus and the tapir and even reptiles I have such a love for reptiles um, I do now focus on primates because I've been over time, just exposed them so much, working with them so much. And I've really found that, you know, rehabilitating these animals, it's a very delicate process. And mm. I feel like it's a process, especially in Central and South America, mm. that we're still working to fully understand how to do best. It's mm. not just about, um, it's not just about helping them recover from being victims of wildlife trafficking, but we really have to stay on stay focused on the main goal of preparing them mm. to be wild again mm -hmm. and that's something that's very complicated to achieve mm. with a species like them who who requires l certain levels of uh, socialization and and a lot of enrichment and and just they're like i said so cognitively complex that addressing the issues that they face specifically from being victims of wildlife trafficking, it's it's a very difficult and complicated process. And I decided I wanted to really just mm. focus on that. So it mm -hmm. kind of just as, as another thing that just sort of came to be as I mm -hmm, continued mm -hmm. on my journey <laughs> through life. And, and what a what a um, what a beautiful challenge, right? The challenge of of understanding the new complexities that now exist as a result of some of our, a lot of our human behavior. Yes. I want to, um, I just want to go back a little bit. Let me see if I can get to this. So when you noticed the complexity of their cognition, what was it that you noticed and how did you go about, um, working with that? I mean, were you looking at it from a healing perspective, you know, which there's a formula for that for humans, but not obviously for wild animals. But, and the other thing is when you, after they've been rehabilitated, are they re-released into the wild, wild, or are they released into protected areas? Because obviously the first part of that would make that process really difficult, right? Like you, what you're trying to do really difficult. And again, I appreciate your attention to that. Like we may not be there yet. And that's what you're, that's what you're, I feel being called to do. So I hope there was a question in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like there was about three. <laughs> okay. Go for it. <laughs> um, the answers are, the answers are a little bit, um, you know, they're not, one size fits all answers. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'll try to go back to the beginning of what you were saying. Um, so initially, I think when I first started, like I said, you know, I, I'm incorporating a lot of my veterinary nursing training in, in what I've been doing with Animals Abroad. So at first it started off um, where my relationship with these animals was, um, a lot of it was just a medical relationship and I was very focused on just you know helping treat them medically and in that process I I kind of got the opportunity to discover them on a more on a deeper level Mm -hmm. than just you know biologically and and medically and that's when I decided, you know, I want to be a little bit more involved in not just the medical part of it and not just helping care for them, but really, really focusing on behavior Mm -hmm. and on rehabilitation. And there were several issues that I had discovered. um, And one of the issues that I personally faced was when medically treating these animals, it kind of put me in a position where I also (laughs) appeared as the enemy to them, Mm -hmm. um, which was difficult for me and difficult for them. And I, I wanted to, to be a part of their rehabilitation as well. You know, I didn't want the, their experiences at the sanctuary to be all negative. Um, even though it's good that animals fear humans, absolutely. I'm not saying that it's not, but some of the animals, especially the ones that who are, who are unable to be released, um, I wanted them to have more positive experiences and, you know, obviously being, being fearful and and also considering everything that they've been through as victims of wildlife trafficking and as pets and props, um, that all contributes to stress. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of that. It was a little bit of experiencing and witnessing how the people who run these sanctuaries handle mm-hmm. these monkeys and mm-hmm. some of the things that they do really well and some of the things that they do that need improvement and some of the things that they do that I feel they do really well but that comes under criticism to some in the scientific world mm-hmm. and to be to be specific I worked twice with a woman in Peru who does a phenomenal job at rehabilitating um, New World primates, which are primates from Central and South America. Uh, She specifically works with howler monkeys, but she does have um, capuchins and tamarinds and woolly monkeys. Um, And just her method, I just feel like she's really good at what she does and she really, really understands the animals. And it's not just a, a strictly science academic thing. It, it's mm-hmm. really just her personal, what she just understands about these animals. And, you know, I've seen her come under great criticism from some biologists and veterinarians for the way that she has worked with these animals and kind of being, they would say, they would claim, that she was being too close to the orphan babies. Mm -hmm. But I took time to really just step back and not make any comments or anything about what was going on and just watch. And I honestly can say that I feel like she is really doing a phenomenal job and knows how important it is that Mm -hmm. these orphans have that close contact. Mm -hmm. And she understands that that bond can be broken at the appropriate time. And she has the documentation and footage to prove that what she's doing is, is working because she fully releases her, her rescues. You know, she doesn't hold on to them and no, they don't go to just, I mean, obviously they go to areas that we believe or, and that they believe are as protected as possible because they're as far away from human encroachment as they can be. Um, but she really does release them. And, you know, when, because monkeys are social animals, a lot of these species form troops, they have to, you know, um, obviously have mates and make families. And 
she has the proof that these monkeys that she's released are doing that. And I think Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just a, a really good example of how we have to take everything into consideration and not be mm-hmm. too strict with our scientific perspective and, mm-hmm. and what we learned in school. And I don't want it to come off the wrong way. I really don't. But I think a lot of what I ended up being passionate about was we have to consider both the experts and the professionals, both the people who have spent a great deal of time in school and in academia studying these animals and learning about them as well as the people who have actually been there in it doing it hands-on alone for so long Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. we we have to consider both sides and that is specifically what i'm passionate about when it comes to primate rehabilitation wow i i love this topic um because i understand and um I agree that you're not trying to go against um, what we're learning in school and science, but we are um, in a constant state of process or a constant Mm -hmm. state of evolution, to Mm -hmm. use that word. So we have to allow ourselves to see what's possible and and in new ways. Um, And again, Mm -hmm. I think it's your generation and some other people that are willing to look at it different. Um, that will move us, you know, to a future that we possibly don't know exactly what it looks like, but we have to take these kinds of risk because I'm going to get a little, you know, frilly here, but love is a, it's a, it's a fiber. It's an unseen fiber Mm -hmm. and it has to be put into the equation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I get it. I I totally get it. We just recently uh, was speaking with a um a uh, another wildlife vet in northern Kenya in Samburu, and mm-hmm. she spoke to me about an elephant that the team was uh, as a, a mobile vet unit that uh, this elephant Sarara would come into the enclosure where they lived right all the time. And he was rambunctious and, you know, he was just, he was fun and friendly, but he was also known for, you know, going about things. Um, but they just loved him and, and they had their own really beautiful, special relationship with him. Mm-hmm. A wild bull elephant, <laughs> right? <Seriously. laughs> I know. I need to hear them say, oh, well, we love the guy, you know? <laughs> so um, he recently, I guess about a year ago, yeah, maybe a year or so ago, he was shot with a dart and they had to treat him. And of course it was incredibly emotional Mm. because they were like, this is our guy, you know? So they treated him and he would come back to the, to the encampment, to where they were staying and, you know, check in. And they're like, okay, he looks good. The wound is healing. And then he'd just disappear off into the bush, nowhere to be seen for days on end. And recently, this is just two, maybe two or three days old. I think it was Saturday that this happened. They found him dead. Um, He had survived one of the worst droughts in the history of Kenya. And they had had some rains and finally some of the rivers were starting to fill up. And there's a, a very special space where all of the bulls would go and hang out when that you know river was in full flow and some new greens were starting to grow, they just started their rains and there was a human wildlife conflict. Now I don't have all the details. I'm just waiting to get some information back, but there was mm. a, a human wildlife conflict. And um, the reason why I'm telling you this story is yeah. that I've talked to two different people from two different sides of it, which is what we've been speaking about. And one was the very scientific side was like, okay, well, that's the way it is. We have to just figure out, blah, 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 blah. And then one was from the other side was like, this is a living being. And we have to check ourselves as much as they have to check themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it made me think about a conversation Jane Goodall had a while ago and she said somebody asked her if you know primates were more like humans or she was trying to discover if primates were like humans and she's like well what if we're like primates like why do we assume that this is all about us 
Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so uh, that sort of ties us back to what you were talking about in, in straddling this line, but being able, I think you're the perfect person, really perfect person to be leaning into this because it, it's possible and you're showing it's possible. So I look forward to the, to the work that you bring to the forefront um, yes. and being able to talk about it in these ways, seriously, mm-hmm. you know, still be considered serious and part of the conversation. Yeah, it is scary because it's, you know, it's a controversial topic and, you know, you, you really open yourself up to, to be criticized and, mm-hmm. you know, to be discredited and it, it is scary, but I know what I have experienced firsthand time and time again at various different sanctuaries. And I honestly feel like I'm on the right path. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, we make mistakes. I'm going to be wrong. Sometimes we're, we're all going to, you know, be wrong in some things that we pursue. But I always say we have to remember that science is tentative. And like you said, it's constantly evolving. We're we're constantly evolving regarding what we know. And if this is something that can help improve the lives of of animals that were victims of such a, you know, a horrible crime that's going on around the world, then it's, it's worth it. And I'm going to give it a shot and, and try to try to share what I believe to be true with, with regards to how we view animals, view animal emotion and how we rehabilitate them. I agree. I'm with you. I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That brings me to a question that uh, uh, our audience might be thinking about when you talk about um, some of the primates that we don't hear about, right? So we hear a lot about gorillas. There was Diane Fossey and, you know, Jane Goodall. And so we hear all that, but you've named quite a few that will be unfamiliar to our audience. And yet these animals are part of a very complex, increasingly deadly and dangerous wildlife crime. Can you talk to us a little bit about what leads to and these abductions for this and why? Yes. So absolutely. First of all, what you, what you said in the beginning, a lot of people, when they think about, um, primate conservation and monkeys. Uh, I feel like a lot of people go straight to gorillas, chimps, which are actually apes and um, also macaques. And the only one that I feel like people really know about that's from the, the Amazon and neotropical rainforests is capuchin monkeys. Mm. Um, But there's such a a wide variety of primate species of new, uh, new world primate species. And, um, they're also very popular because a lot of them are very small. So you have your capuchin, which is the size of a cat, but you also have tamarines, which are very small. You have dusky titi monkeys, which are very small, and they're very appealing to people as pets because they have these little tiny fluffy cute faces. And mm. for anyone who doesn't mm. know what they are, look them up. They're really cute. Um, and so because of that, they are they are very hot on the pet trade market. Um, And Mm. so these animals, um, they're sold as pets. A lot of people want to keep them as pets. And a lot of time it's a lot of times it's not just them being sent. Like a lot of people think that they're all being sent to like the United States and the UK and other places as pets. But a lot of it is just local people who want to have monkeys as pets. Um, So they're sold for that. They're sold sometimes as bush meat. There are places that eat these animals. Mm. Um, and then they are also used as tourist attractions. And so if there's a company or a hotel or an attraction that has, they'll, they'll try and obtain a monkey or two or several. Um, and then that makes tourists want to come and tourists want to take pictures with them. Mm. And so a lot of times, you know, I tell people if you see, and you're going to see this, if you go to Dominican Republic or if you go to Mexico, you're going to see people with a monkey on a leash asking Mm. if you want to take a picture with it. And that is all part of illegal wildlife trade. There's never any 
there's never a point where you should believe anybody that tells you that they've rescued the monkey and that the mother died. That has mm. never, that doesn't happen. That only happens because somebody killed her. Um, most likely her abductors who sold her to this person. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a big, big part of it. It's just people trying to bring mm. in money mm-hmm. from tourists or people trying to bring in money by selling them as pets. And so it's just, it's a constant battle to remind people you really shouldn't be in contact with these animals at all. Um, And this includes other species, jaguars. There's a place where you can visit, like swim with jaguars in Honduras, which is extremely unethical. Mm. Um, Lots of places in, in South America and Central America where you can hold sloths which is extremely unethical because holding mm. a sloth causes a great deal of stress. <clears throat> stress. So there's all these things that we have to constantly remind people that this is inappropriate and it's fueling and contributing to wildlife trafficking. So it's, it's a very complicated thing that goes in several different directions and it's, it's very hard to, to get on top of. Do you sense that there's not um a lot of attention paid to latin america with regards to this we hear mostly um in the conservation circles with regards to uh wildlife trafficking we hear a lot about africa and yeah uh, parts of asia but not a lot about latin america what do you think um would be some of the best ways to sort of bring the heightened awareness to that. Hi, Joey. Hi, Marley. Joey, first let me ask you, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And you? Uh, I'm doing fine. I am doing yeah. fine. <laughs> This section is called Off the Top, and so I will ask 10 questions, and you will have to answer them just as quickly as you can. Are you ready? I'm ready. What is your idea of perfect happiness? My idea of perfect happiness is just living a life dedicated to my purpose and my passion, where both professionally and recreationally, Um, I'm able to just be in my passion and there's no thick divide between work and play, I would say. Which living person do you admire the most? So I would say living person, one of my biggest people that I admire most is Jane Goodall. Um, Also, I admire the motivational speaker and entrepreneur Gary Vee because I agree with a lot of his points of views. but unliving the people who have passed away that i admire i have to just give recognition to them too it's definitely diane fossey steve Irwin, and alan watts which words or phrases do you most overuse i think i overuse the phrase live in your purpose because i believe in it more than anything else if you were to die and come back as a person or a thing what would it be I think I would come back as, I don't know a particular person, but I would come back as a filmmaker because it's something that I really want to do, but I I don't think I have time to spread myself all over (laughs) that much. But I I think I would be a filmmaker if I came back. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? (laughs) Um, Working working a job that I hate and and living on the hamster wheel. What do you most value in friends? Um, I value in my personal friends um, that they they accept me for who I am. Um, they're very supportive and they always are there to make me laugh. They're just, I have such a great support group of friends and I appreciate that. What profession other than your own would you not like to attend? I would not like to be a part of any job that is that keeps me at a desk or that is predictable you know like a predictable everyday mundane job no it's not for me what or who is your greatest love of your life 
I would have to say the greatest love of my life would be the universe. Like I, I just have a love for the universe and that is what I, I put before everything else. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Being inspired by possibility and um, being motivated by the success of other people. I just feel like watching other people's success is a, a clear representation of what's possible for me. So I love to see other people being successful. If you could have written anything in the world, what would it have been? It hasn't been written yet, but I hope, I hope to write it soon. I hope to write a little bit about my experiences. If I have to write anything, it hasn't been written yet. That is the end of me. Thank you very much. Have a good new year. And maybe I'll see you next year on the podcast again. Yes. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Thank you. Happy, Happy new, new year. Ah, oh, that's really wonderful. I am so enjoying Marley's new segment of the podcast. So our guest today is Joey. She is the founder of Jungle Rescue Reform. She's talking to us about her work in the wildlife rehabilitation centers across Central and South America, predominantly in the Amazon region, where she helps rehabilitate, medically care for, research, and eventually release wildlife victims of the illegal pet trade. So sit tight for a moment. We'll be right back to finish our conversation with Joey. Yes, so um, just what I was speaking about was um, how there's such a there, there seems to be such a great interest in the animals, wildlife species in Africa and in Asia, and people seem to be seem to be more educated or know a little bit more about the endangered species in that part those parts of the world, and they even seem to be more motivated to to help those animals. And hmm. I've always felt a little bit confused by why we're not also as focused on, educated on, and and motivated to to do something about the animals in the Amazon rainforest. And what I was saying was, especially from you know this part of the world, us being from the United States, we're the closest to Central and South America, mm-hmm. and okay. and I don't know why we don't have more of a interest in in these animals, these amazing species in this amazing rainforest, the Amazon rainforest, um, which contains species that we still haven't even learned about yet. Um, you have so many people who, even even who are in school, you know, they want to pursue biology, they want to pursue zoology, wildlife conservation, and they all put their focus and their thesis studies in other parts of the world. And it just seems like nobody's interested in or, or at least me personally, I have not really experienced anyone who is really interested or knows about all the species that also need protection um, and are endangered and, and going through different, different trials thanks to uh, human encroachment in the Amazon rainforest. So I feel like it's important that we put a face I feel like it would be important if we put more of a face to these animals and bring them more to the forefront uh, when discussing wildlife conservation and endangered species and habitat laws Um, and what I was going to ask you before was one thing that I like to bring up is I don't know if you've ever seen the animated film the Disney film Encanto have you seen it I did watch that yes okay so I got so excited (laughs) <laughs> watching that film because in that film they they represent so many species that you mm. don't see in any other film and it's it's a it's a cartoon so you know you have kids watching it you have mm-hmm. kids maybe asking about these species and so I don't know if you caught it but they had capybara on there they had tapir on there they had coedamundis and these are animals that a lot of people don't know about yeah. Um, and so I was so excited. I was like, oh, my God, you know, because it's based in Colombia and they really, you know, Disney really took the time to show yeah. these animals and represent these species that people really I don't, you know, they don't know about. If I mention a tapir to somebody or Kuwait Mundi, most people don't know what I'm talking about. So it was it was really nice to see those guys on there. 
they were represented. I yes. love that. <laughs> I love that. I loved that film. Mm -hmm. um, it really makes me, my mind spin about creativity and, and creative ways at which we'll bring attention to these because sometimes I feel that there's an overwhelming, it's easy to get overwhelmed with the amount of destruction of the, of the, of everything, mm -hmm. but uh, the natural world and of the wildlife. So thinking about it creatively, I love, I love that they, they looked that, that it was done in that way in a cartoon mm -hmm. and it was introduced to children and, and um, you know, it's a start. This is a huge planet and I don't know why we pay so much attention in the Northern hemisphere to certain things. Um, but you're here. So here you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Hopefully. that's for like part of our goal, part of my goal and the emerging world projects goal is to, you know, bring a more heightened awareness to these areas that are not being shined upon, or at least uh, the things about the Amazon are not being certain things about the Amazon and those areas are not being looked at. And yeah, I absolutely. think that it's time that we put eyes on it and continue to move in a, in a different direction. This is a yes, liminal space. It's, yes. it's um, a really important space to be in. Um, can you talk to me about what your organization's intentions are in assisting local organizations and how are you going about it? And you've probably already answered this. Why do you think it's important? So um, my organization is Jungle Rescue Reform, and I'm currently working on making it a 501c3 organization, a nonprofit organization. I'm just looking for members to be on the team because you, you need that um, mm. before you can pursue, you know, try to be, try to register for being a nonprofit. But I started off just, you know, getting the organization together, building the website, making the logo and everything. Mm -hmm. And my my goal with it is really to assist these sanctuaries in any way they possibly need. Um, because my passion and, and I put most of my attention to wildlife rehabilitation sanctuaries that are in remote places of the Amazon and even in the forests of Central America. These are very, I don't want to say small in the sense that they're physically small because a lot of them house hundreds of individual animals, individually, individual rescued animals. But they're small in the sense that not a lot of people know about them. They're run mm -hmm. by small families that, mm -hmm. you know, just noticed an issue in their environment, in their, their natural home and, and wanted to dedicate their lives to saving these animals. So it is these small sanctuaries, these less spoken about sanctuaries that I really want mm -hmm. to be an advocate for and, and give any type of support I can, um, whether that be raising funds or helping funnel volunteers especially professional volunteers those who are veterinary students or or mm. veterinarians biologists biology students um kind of helping to funnel them more towards these less known places because when people when you have students or or people even just regular people who want to volunteer with wildlife, it is very, very hard for them to be put into contact with these places. Mm -hmm. If there is a student who goes to university, a lot of times these universities, they'll provide a few opportunities to do some, some study abroad and work abroad with wildlife. But one thing that happens is for some reason, and again, I guess it's because they're going through their university, it costs so much for them to participate and they're also only being ex like introduced to very big popular places that get a lot of mm -hmm. funding and a lot of attention and i think that it's important that these other places these smaller places that people learn about them as well and they have a way to to contact these places and get involved with with the conservation work being done at these places um, 
because it's extremely affordable, first of all, because they're really just paying, if they're paying anything, most of the time they're just paying for their food and for them to keep a roof over their head. Um, and they get to just really be involved more in in the community and working mm. with people who are directly from this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I just feel like these places need a lot more attention than what they get. And I, I just want to be here to provide that, to provide, to, to help them with fundraisers and help provide financial support. And also I, I, I go to these places to conduct my research with primate rehabilitation. And I hope to kind of, you know, be be someone who helps them improve in any way that they need to or want to in how mm. they're rehabilitating their animals and help them to release these animals. Because a lot of times what happens is if they run into issues with rehabilitating the animals that they have in their care, they end up holding on to them. They end up not being able to release them for one reason or another. Um, and the, the ones coming in, that never stops. So they just keep getting more and more while they're simultaneously having problems releasing what they already have. So it puts a lot of strain on the staff that's there. It puts a lot of financial strain. Um, the animals don't get as much individual care as they need. So th those are all things that I feel like need to be considered. And I want to kind of help in any way that I can with that. I think that by provide, you know, helping provide volunteers and funding, you know, it could kind of lift the Ex load. Yeah, I think it's really, really important um, because they don't, I mean, obviously they don't get the massive amount of fund funding or a mm -hmm. celebrity backing or mm -hmm, exactly. a, a movie made about them or something about exactly. that. So, mm -hmm. and I'm all for, you know, getting dirt under your nails. Community conservation is where we're headed it needs to be where we're headed yes um so that's some really powerful stuff that you're putting into motion and i i feel like i keep repeating myself but i really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your ability to see uh where these cracks are and and what might be you know how they might be assisted and and filled or what's coming up from those cracks mm -hmm. i should say i want to go back a little bit because i know that you spent some time in some in some pretty dangerous areas. Um, and it can't be easy to leave your family and friends for those extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a little bit of some of the challenges you, you might face both mentally and physically? Uh, so yeah, so that's the probably the most difficult part of any of it. For me, going, being out there, being without electricity or without mm. hot water, that's totally fine. <laughs> I'm used to mm -hmm. it. I don't mind at all. The travel is fine. I love it. Um, it's the leaving. I have I have a lot of pets, so leaving them behind is mm. very hard. They're my family. Mm. Um, leaving my significant other um, is very difficult because he is <laughs> very different from me. So mm. He does not, and, and that's the case I feel like with anybody that I know, they don't really, you know, what, what I do is almost feels like a foreign concept to everyone around me. Um, and so when they hear, you know, okay, I'm going to this part of the jungle, I'm going to that, for them it's very scary, you know, and I can understand that they're constantly worried about me. And the reality is, yes, I am often put in, Situ challenging situations. I've been put in many scary situations. And I think, you know, leaving and, and putting them in a situation where they have to be concerned for me, it's always difficult. And like I said, it's difficult leaving my pets. I'm very close to my animals and I have mm -hmm. so many of them. <laughs> and I have to make so many preparations to have them all cared for mm -hmm. um, properly and stuff. I bet Both they can't wait for the stories you have to tell them. <laughs> when you get back and there was right. this macaque you have no idea <laughs> <laughs> yes there's that um there's you know I feel sometimes I feel guilty I feel guilty a lot of times I feel guilty leaving you know letting my job now every time like you know mm -hmm. going away for this many amount of weeks I feel guilty uh leaving my boyfriend behind and sometimes he knows like sometimes I'll be leaving and I'm like 
okay, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have some sort of cellular connection, but we're going to just have to play it by ear. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, it's hard. I feel bad, but mm -hmm. I, anyone who is involved with me or who has employed me, who hasn't, or even him getting into a relationship with me, they knew ahead of time what, mm -hmm. <laughs> what I do. Mm -hmm. So it's just as part of the package, but it is hard. And you find your, you find your balance. You have I any definitely do. special practices that you, you do to keep your balance? Um, so one thing I do is I really try to organize my time that I'm going to be away. And I definitely don't schedule any time to be away from mid-October to the end of December. So that I'm home for the holidays. I'm, I'm with everyone for the holidays. I'm able to work for the holidays. Um, so that's one big important thing for me. And just before I book any travels, I try to just consider everybody else. I, I consider how this is going to impact the people in my life. And I just try to be as considerate as possible with that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I come back and I try to bring everybody a little something special, a gift. Mm. <laughs> like, uh, yes, I was away, but here's something from the Amazon that you're probably not going to get from anywhere else. So. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's a really, a really unique and unique life. Um, yeah, being really wonderfully orchestrated. So I want to ask you about Miguelito. <laughs> I want to hear the story of this, this little one. Do you so, mind sharing it with us? Sure, sure. Um, okay. So Miguelito is, Miguelito was actually one of the first monkeys who inspired me to want to work with primates. And he was one of the howler monkeys at the Wildlife Rescue Center in Peru, which is called, for anyone who's wondering, it's Amazon Shelter in Peru. Um, he was one of the animals that we were caring for there. And he was a really, he, I loved him so much. He was kept in an enclosure with a female so he had his partner and he was a beautiful red howler monkey um and i had to we had to sedate him because at the time me and a veterinarian from lima we were at this wildlife sanctuary every day sedating different groups of monkeys so that we can perform certain tests on them like blood tests and give them some vaccines which is required by that by the Peruvian government before any of these animals can be released um, which is another problem they face when it comes to releasing their animals but anyway that's uh, that's what we were doing so Miguelito was the last one on the list him and his girlfriend I think her name was Patricia <laughs> um, <laughs> they were uh, the last ones on the list and Every time, every day that I was there, I would go and, and visit him and just say hi to him. And everybody knew that he kind of, he was, a, he was kind of standoffish, but he liked me. Um, so everybody knew that. Um, but then when it came time to sedate him so we could bring him back to the little clinic there, he, it, it was not possible. He became so, he was very intelligent. He knew that we were trying to do something. Um mm. And we just, we, we couldn't do it. He was so, he was a large male. He was strong. And so we had to think of creative ways to try and sedate this monkey. Uh, and while also making sure that we don't get hurt in the process. So it, it wasn't working out. It was extremely hot that day. There was mosquitoes all over my face. And finally the, the veterinarian said to me, he said, you know, Miguelito likes you what we're going to, I'm going to try and just leave this to you <laughs> to do. Um, and so we had, we had decided that instead of injecting him with the sedative, we were going to try and administer it orally, which would work just enough for us to be able to get him in the net. And then we could give him a little bit more if we needed to. And so I had come up with the idea that since when sedating animals, they don't eat, we have to make sure that they don't eat. So mm -hmm. he had not eaten all day. And so I was like, he's probably hungry. I'm going mm. to take some of his favorite foods and wrap it in a syringe. And as he goes to eat it, I'm going to plunge the sedative forward into his mouth. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's what I, that's what I did. And it kind of, it, it worked, but 
he, like I said, and and I, I do understand the importance of taking my emotion out of these situations, mm-hmm. but he was, he was one of the residents there that we did have a little bit of a relationship. He, you know, we did like each other, like he liked mm-hmm. me and, you know, we <laughs> got along, <laughs> me and him, and he didn't always get along with everyone. So in that moment when I had tricked him, his whole body fl- flung backwards. Mm-hmm. And then he looked at me in this way that I'll never forget this this way that just is a, a reminder almost. And again, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize at all for all the academics listening and having a heart attack. I'm not <laughs> trying to do that, but um, <laughs> the scientists out there, um, he, he just looked at me like this, this face of shock and just like, he was so taken back by what I did by tricking him. He then lunged forward, tried to attack me. And it was just such, um, again, it was just wow. such, a moment where I was able to just get the full scope of what it is to work with these animals and, and treat them medically and also, you know, help them help, help with their rehabilitation and, and work with them. And that fine line between having them trust you yet having to, to properly care for them. It's just, it was just one moment of me just getting a full understanding of how mm. difficult it is to work with these monkeys mm-hmm. and provide the care that they need while trying to also keep your distance, but also needing to get close to them in order to care for them. It just, it just made me see all the complications involved in that one moment. And it hurt my heart so much. And I was still mm-hmm. very new to everything and, mm-hmm. and new in my studies of, of wildlife conservation and, and primatology that, you know, I just, it, it was just a very emotional experience for me, but it is what started my mm-hmm. being interested in mm-hmm. primate rehabilitation and work. And I just, I just continued to build on it from there, from that experience. That was the transformative moment, right? Mm -hmm. I just feel like we can't be so strict in in one direction Mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. We have Mm -hmm. to really just understand these animals as sentient beings and, um, you know, just work with them in ways that that are beneficial for for them, both physically and psychologically and emotionally. Right, right. When I I talk about um, studying elephants and I really... I've uh, shifted the way in which I go about it. And it more ha- it has more to do with now in the last decade with looking at how we cannot destroy each other. Mm-hmm. To really understand an animal, not to take it apart like a transistor radio, not like that, mm-hmm. but to almost, in not almost, but to empower them and ourselves so that we don't destroy each other Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. that's all that's happening. Um, I'm not even certain and I'm going to go against, I don't know, whatever, but I'm not even certain that saving, you know, using saving is the proper way to approach this, right? This has to be more looked at like uh, coexistence, co-creation, co-regeneration, right? Like Like we're in this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I get a little I get a little uptight lately when I when I hear this um people talking about uh, you know, well they raided the crops. Well, first of all, we might want to change our language about that. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. I'm certain that they're not out there going, Oh, let's go and raid the crops. Like they're not criminals. Exactly. So we have to change our language and the way in which we're viewing what we think we're doing, you know? Yeah. That's a part of it. And and all of of that is, is human encroachment. You know, if there's Mm -hmm. any type of Mm -hmm. encounter interaction with wildlife, that's unpleasant. You know, it's because of our encroachment in their environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a project that I've just begun working on and it has to do with this, this corridor and really looking at how nature needs to be connected one Mm -hmm. ecosystem to the next, to the next, to the next. And when we've disrupted this corridor, right, let's say from North America all the way down to uh, the, the deepest part of South America running through California, this corridor is 
connected. So animals are moving in directions in which they wouldn't normally move, mm -hmm. but nature yes. loves connectivity. Mm -hmm. It thrives in connectivity. Mm -hmm. So it makes you, you know, question again, you know, mm, spaces that we're going to wall off and, you know, keep you, keep them in this area. And it's like, uh, no, we're kind of funny, kind of hubris. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah. We have to, we have to coexist. It's not, it's just, just our planet or our specific right. areas closed off to them. It's just not reality. Okay. So Joey, this has just been a really beautiful, wonderful conversation. There's so much wonderful information in here and you've really opened up to us and, and given us some, some things to think about. And I appreciate that greatly. I appreciate the work that you're that you're doing that you will continue to do. Um, I'd love to give you the opportunity to wrap up our call with anything that you want to share with folks. Um, anything that I want to share with folks is just um, if you're somebody who is in, who's interested in wildlife conservation, wildlife rehabilitation, wild, any type of wildlife care or biology, please pursue all avenues all, all opportunities available to you um, and don't think that you have to have your mind set on what exactly you want to do. There's so many great opportunities. And if you want to get involved in conservation and wildlife research in Central and South America, feel free to reach out to me. And I just also want to remind everyone that there is a, a wonderful collection of species, some that we haven't even discovered yet in the Amazon rainforest. And, mm. um, you know, that's a very important part of our planet, the Amazon rainforest. And there's a lot happening there with fires and deforestation and, and illegal wildlife trafficking that we all need to be conscious of, especially when we travel. If traveling abroad and deciding to go to South America or Central America, please do your research on places that you go to and make sure that you're not engaging in any activities that seem harmless but are contributing to, to wildlife trafficking. What a wonderful way to wrap it up. So many really important points about traveling and doing your doing your homework. So do your homework, folks. Um, Marley mentioned perhaps seeing you because um, our next podcast will be on the road. We will be exploring some of the guests that we've spoken to before in your space. So oh, don't that's be surprised. Right? <laughs> Don't be surprised if you get a call from us saying, which flight do we take to Peru or wherever you might be? <laughs> oh, that would be um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've made so many wonderful friends across the globe and um, community conservation, that sort of avenue is something that we really want to be a part of and to also highlight. That's what he was alluding to. <laughs> um, in the show notes, we'll leave all of your information. It was okay. a absolutely magnificent experience to have you on the show and I appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us and Thank you. can only wish you the most supportive nurturing success in the work that you're you're doing thank you so much and thank you so much for having me on your show absolutely thank you for stopping by you can help us spread the word about what are you doing here by sharing this episode or leaving a review in your favorite podcast app. Reviews help potential listeners see that our show is worth their time and every single one makes a difference. For a deeper look at what the Emerging World Project is up to, head on over to emergingworldproject.org. The Emerging World Project studios are on Tongva land. 